Yes. Um, our next speaker is William Helfrecht. Uh, his collection is curator at the National Gallery of the Cayman Islands, where his research interests include uh, Caymanian visual culture and contemporary Caribbean art. He has authored several catalog essays on Caymanian art and um, recently presented papers at the Museums Association of the Caribbean Conference in the Bahamas and uh, at the Rex Nettle Ford Arts Conference in Kingston, Jamaica. He holds a BA in Art History from the Courtauld Institute of Art and an MA in Modern and Curatorial Studies from Columbia University. Thank you very much for that introduction and um, very happy to be here. Right, um, so I'm, I'm going to begin my presentation. Um, I want to provide a, uh, a short historical background and context to the, uh, the artists and the case studies I'm going to be talking about today. Um, and this really expands upon the, the short paper um, that I authored in the materials for discussion. Um, and I'm going to be talking about this um, attempt to theorize um, what's been happening, I think, for, for several years in um, Caymanian art and in particular the work of several contemporary artists who I'm going to be highlighting today. And it revolves around this concept of insular aesthetics. So I've put some, uh, some of this uh, outlined on the screen for you, but really informed by um, the evolution of Caymanian history, society, and identity, and how those themes have inflected the work of um, several of the contemporary artists that we're going to be talking about today. Now, in particular, um, I'm going to elucidate um, some of the uh, maritime heritage that is, is very critical in this discussion, and in particular, this um, idea of the periphery, particularly in terms of um, historical cartographic representations of the region and of Cayman in particular, and how this, um, this field has really provided a kind of visual lexicon um, for the work of the contemporary artists that we're going to be talking about today. Um, so I begin here with a, a significant artifact really this is the cantino planisphere so it's a world map uh, and it was uh, it, it's in milan um, in italy um, uh, and it was produced uh, on parchment so several pieces of parchment that have been joined together and it's a world map um, and it's particularly significant as an example uh, of um, these cartographic representations um, that touches upon this era of colonial conquest um, and scientific inquiry in the Renaissance and the Enlightenment. Um, now, why this document is particularly significant for the artists and, and the works that I'm going to be presenting today is, in fact, its date, because there's been um, a lot of debate around the significance or uh, the weight that's placed on these origin stories, these dates that are held up as these kind of mythical moments in which uh, islands uh, with, which have histories that long predate the era of colonial conquest in the Caribbean somehow sprung magically into existence. And um, the date 1503 is particularly significant for the Cayman Islands and has long been held as this sort of foundational moment. And I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the introduction of Emancipation Day that's happened uh, this year in 2024 um, and how that relates to the previous a national holiday of uh, Discovery Day, which has still, in fact, been retained. Um, and here's another representation, this time by um, a French cartographer, Pierre de Cellier. And again, uh, I would say it's significant for a number of reasons, particularly for what's not represented. So um, these blank spaces that you'll see, particularly in the north, or what I should say, the, the South, and that's something I'm going to talk about with this image in particular. The significance of being charted on the map, and particularly this idea, as I've alluded to already, of being symbolically summoned into existence. Um, and in particular, the Eurocentricity of um, Mercator projections and the subordination of the Global South 
uh, I picked this example, which is actually in the collection of the British Library and was um, shown in facsimile form uh, at a recent exhibition that I'm going to talk about at the National Gallery. Um, we see that conventional north-south axis uh, inverted. So in effect, this is an upside down map, if you like, um, one in which the French interest, um, particularly in the maritime provinces of Canada at the time, is being foregrounded. Um, you'll also note um, this idea that I've, I've, I've mentioned at the outset, this vi visual language of maps um, and the inherent artistry of uh, the marginalia. So what, what I particularly like in this representation, if you look closely, is some of these sort of fantastic um, sea monsters, these sort of flights of whimsy and imagination that you'll see in the illustration. And then we come to the 18th century. So um, th this image here um, is the, the first formal survey of Grand Cayman, and it dates from 1773. Uh, it was undertaken by the Royal Navy and the surveyor George Gould. Um, now, what you won't be able to read, um, because I think it, he's got this very florid handwriting and the, the print is too small, but the descriptive notes um, for me are almost as interesting as the map, uh, although it is interesting to note that the um, this was actually exceedingly accurate for its day, and it was only really superseded in the 1950s and 60s when um, aerial photography and the Ordnance Survey carried out the first truly accurate maps of the island. Um, but in those notes, um, George Gould really establishes this narrative of uh, the Caymanas, as the islands were known at the time, and, and there were uh, names that were used by different um, colonial powers, so Las Tortugas uh, initially uh, by the Spanish. But um, that narrative really was instrumental in establishing um, this notion of uh, the Cayman Islands as a lawless, uh, far-flung, uh, over overlooked and economically and politically inconsequential um, appendage of Jamaica. Um, so with the Treaty of Madrid in 1670, um, Jamaica was formally recognized as falling under British sovereignty. And so uh, kind of by extension, the Cayman Islands uh, thus became a British colony. And um, after the uh, independence of Jamaica in 1962, um, have in fact remained uh, a British overseas territory to this day. Now, how does that relate to uh, contemporary art, you might say? Um, as I just mentioned, I think um, this idea of the periphery, which several speakers have um, alluded to uh, in different ways in their presentations, both here today and uh, earlier in the conference, um, establishes this dynamic of uh, colonizer and colonized and is really part of the longstanding othering of Caribbean artists. Um, to which uh, in more recent years we have seen uh, something of a counterpoint with the uh, proliferation of these um, fairly uh, prominent uh, mega um, traveling group exhibitions. And I've just given a couple examples here on the left, uh, forecast form, art in the Caribbean diaspora, um, installed in that instance at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago. Uh, and also life between islands. Um, uh, interestingly, both of these projects took uh, this sort of diasporic approach, particularly life between islands, which is really an exploration of uh, Afro-British um, cultural expression. Uh, and interesting to note as well that um, Caymanian artists are conspicuously absent from uh, both of these shows uh, as it happens. Um, I'm going to introduce perhaps the, um, uh, the principal protagonist in, in this story that I'm going to tell today about um, cartography and its influence on, on contemporary Caymanian art, and that is Bendel Hides. And I've put on the screen here uh, a portrait of the artist, uh, quite a moody, uh, brooding one at that, um, um, from his New York studio in the mid-1980s. Um, I think I'd like to draw attention firstly to um, three things here that are, I believe are significant. First is in terms of um, legibility, the artist's identity and how that has been read uh, and received um, 
an artist who presents as white, um, but is in fact of, of mixed racial heritage and significant, uh, I suppose, in, in terms of what I'm going to discuss in a moment is this categorical ambiguity. Um, the challenges, particularly we were talking about the othering of Caribbean artists, a sort of double othering uh, of Caymanian artists as being harder perhaps to fit into these neat um, categorical boxes. Um, and also, an, uh, in this case, I, I mentioned the exclusion um, within mainstream um, art historical discourse, and in particularly in, in exhibitions of contemporary Caymanian art. Um, Bendel Hides is something of an exception whose work has been presented in several um, major group shows, particularly in the 1990s, uh, 500 years after a big show, sort of um, quincentennial show of Caribbean art in 1993. Carib Art, which was another traveling exhibition produced by uh, under the auspices of UNESCO in 1994, and the Caribbean Visions exhibition, which traveled to several uh, major museums in the United States in 1998. Um, and here's an example of uh, a work of Bendel Hyde's. This, this one, in, in fact, was one that traveled to those uh, exhibitions that I just mentioned, Gulf Stream. So, uh, again, as I said, the, 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 a bit of contextual information um, to precede the artwork case studies that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, and this relates again um, to um, discussions that have uh, circulated in, in kind of populist narratives around um, the Cayman Islands and particularly comparisons when talking about the broader Caribbean cultural context to immediate neighbors such as Jamaica uh, and indeed Barbados. Um, uh, and that, in, in many instances, uh, refers to um, economic conditions as well as slavery. Um, I mentioned that 2024 has been a significant year for the Cayman Islands, um, in part for the government's reintroduction after uh, a 65-year hiatus of uh, national celebration of Emancipation Day, which has been something that we're very happy to, to see. Um, and is really a corrective to um, years in which um, Cayman's existence as a slave society, and it, and it certainly was uh, a slave society, has been glossed over. Um, and I put some statistics here. Uh, the corporate report, the first um, census from 1802, uh, small population of 933, but uh, at that instance, 545 people who were enslaved, and that would rise to just short of a thousand uh, on the eve of emancipation uh, in 1835. Um, I've also put some information there, more about contemporary Caymanian society and uh, looking at the, the sort of demographic breakdown of society. Now, uh, I think this has also been overstated. I mean, there are uh, multicultural and stratified racial hierarchies across um, the Caribbean. Um, I had alluded to uh, an important text by a Kimanian historian in my in my paper, uh, Roy Botton, who uses this term pigmentocracy, and it's obviously um, related to um, colorism and 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 uh, stratify stratification of racial hierarchy. But um, being that we're in Scotland, I think it's also to note in terms of these origin stories, a lot of those statistics refer to more recent immigrants, and there is uh, uh, has been a recent um, politicizing of identity politics, and in particular calls for immigration reform with the influx of um, immigrant labor um, that is highly problematic. Um, but also what's not here, I think, being that we're in Scotland, is, is the substantial um, Scottish ancestry and connections that you'll find in the Cayman Islands. So uh, some of the most common family names, for instance, uh, Scott, Chisholm, McTaggart, McLaughlin, and so on. So an interesting point of connection. Um, and I put a quote here by Caymanian scholar Christopher Williams, um, who is really uh, at the forefront of this question of um, <laughs> trying to pinpoint and, and come to some sort of resolution in terms of how we define the Kamanian identity. So 
So I'm going to move on and, and discuss some of the works that I wanted to present with you today. Um, this first one, a very visually striking um, piece by the artist Nasaria Suku Shalet, and it's from her Alchemy series, this transformation, uh, transformation of, of, of base materials uh, and uh, ubiquitous materials. But in particular, on the left, the work titled Things We Brought With Us Beyond the Door of No Return, I think makes its its point very clearly. Um, this acknowledgement of the legacy of slavery, this belated acknowledgement and uh, evoking uh, dark places such as Cape Coast Castle in Ghana. One of the other artists that I'm going to talk about today is Davin Ebanks, who's probably uh, Cayman's former sculptor and a glass sculptor at that. He is um, a very deft um, uh, molder, uh, shaper of glass. And I, I wanted to um, fit, focus on this work in particular, Passages Triptych, thinking about the triangular trade. And in particular, as a sculptor, um, very influenced by uh, Caymanian artists such as Bendel Hydes, who exploits the symbolic resonance of color, you know, the painterly qualities of color and symbolic resonances, um, and obviously the inspiring late Gothic architecture that we're surrounded by here. I was also thinking in his work not only of the haunting specter of the slave ship, and those um, infamous diagrammatic representations of human cargo, but also the ecclesiastical form of Gothic church windows. So there's this sense of spiritual reverence in his work. So as I move to my conclusion, um, I want to give um, a couple of images on the screen so you can see how this cartographic language has evolved um, from the more symbolic use of um, the iconography of maps in, in work uh, such as this by Pendle Hides, where you see uh, a sort of poetic scrambling of the informational coordinates of map imagery. Um, and Frank Bowling being a, an office uh, equivalent as a, an, a diasporic Caribbean artist. A um, couple of installation shots from that exhibition that I alluded to that was mounted last year at the National Gallery of the Cayman Islands. And we can see uh, a late work by Bendel Hydes there in the background, part of his Circumnavigating the Globe series. And in the foreground, a sculptural work again by the artist Davin Ebanks. And there's another image of that piece. Um, I wanted to also talk a, a little bit about this idea of the map as logo and the branding of national identity across the Caribbean, which is um, something that we see in, in terms of this commodification in, in tourist economies. And um, I've, I've put a couple of examples of some other contemporary Caribbean artists, both um, from Puerto Rico and Cuba. And obviously there's a politicizing of the map in the context of these nationalist uh, territorial imperatives so that obviously territories um, and as well as independent post-colonial states. Um, uh, final couple of works that I'm going to show um, kind of bringing us up into this present moment where uh, contemporary artists in Cayman are dealing with issues of uh, overdevelopment. So in this case, these references to the fragmentation of the landscape through the, the kind of block and parcel uh, mapping and the draining of mangrove swamps. Um, uh, and then moving into the digital sphere, perhaps as this uh, final frontier, if you like, so the use of AI uh, by this artist, Caitlin Elphinstone, uh, mining the archive, um, where you, you see in these images this distortion of place and memory. Um, Finally here, Brandon Saunders, a young artist, um, height, length, and width. Again, um, using digital technology, and in this case, the artist has created three-dimensional scans uh, and UV mapping to create a, a two-dimensional projection of an embodied subject. So this is a self-portrait. Uh, and I think um, on the left-hand image, you'll see this almost jigsaw um, a uh, fragment-like uh, resemblance to an archipelago of small islands. So it makes me think of the uh, the John Dunn quote, uh, no man is an island, and perhaps um, the opposite is true in the 21st century. Um, so in conclusion, um, 
we, we've talked a little bit about the, the, the commonalities in, in small island developing states, particularly as it relates to uh, global concerns of climate change. Uh, and as in our previous uh, presenters um, presentation, I think this this re very real threat of, of being wiped off the map. Um, uh, we've also looked uh, more recently at this idea of the anti map. So um, this idea of uncovering and bringing to light hidden or subtending histories. Um, and I think I'd like to end just by saying on that note, um, the potential for uh, empowering uh, a more restorative process in the way that we are revisiting these landscapes uh, and an opportunity both to um, to reclaim uh, and also honor our collective heritage. So thank you very much.